I work at Balderdash. Um, Balderdash is a Node.js consulting firm. We built and maintain the JS framework, um, the Waterline ORM, among a bunch of other Node modules. Um, if you want to email me, that's my email address. I'm on GitHub. I'm TJ Webb, nearly everywhere on the internet. Um, somebody else already took it. Or unless in a couple of cases, I signed up for an account two ago, forgot my password, and then can't get back in. I'm also the, Nor <laughs> I'm also the organizer of, uh, a co-organizer of, of Norfolk JS. Um, and I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. We have a JavaScript group that meets every month, much like this. Um, we have speakers come give talks and so forth. Uh, Norfolk happens to be a direct flight from Minneapolis. If anybody wants to come down and hang out, um, especially winter, um, it's, it's warmer down there. Um, drop me a line and we can uh, figure out a topic to talk about. We're working on a book, uh, Sales.js in Action. Um, it's a Manning book and it's, you can get early access to it online. About half the chapters are done. It's gonna be released in the spring. That's a resource for you if you wanna get uh, more Okay, this is a slide to say that I, I have a few more slides. Um, so this, basically the, the overview of the talk, the, the, the outline of the talk is pretty simple. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about what sales is and does. I'm going to talk about API-driven development, a quick overview of what that, I, that is to me and how we um, employ it. And then I'm going to code for a little bit and just prototype some things out to give you a sense of how we operate, how sales facilitates some of the back end development process, and then we'll talk about questions. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. I'm, I'm happy to be, have this be as collaborative as, as you guys want. Sales um, is a Node web framework. It's based on Express. So if you already know Express.js, Sales is actually, it's pretty easy to pick up. It's just Express.js with some ca scaffolding around it. Um, hooks in with Socket.io and some other things automatically. And um, it's really good for giving talks on API-driven development. <laughs> what? Can, what's up? Can click, the click what? Oh, make that thing go away? Yeah. Where's my mouse? Okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Um, cool. I've only I've had this Mac for like four days. I've had a, um, a ThinkPad running Ubuntu for like past years and years, so still getting used to the Mac world. Waterline is an ORM layer. Um, it, it's bundled with Sales, but you can swap it out for other stuff. It's also it functions as a standalone ORM layer. So if you want to interact with a bunch of different databases and don't necessarily want to write SQL and want to have a common interface for all of your uh, persistence layer operations. Waterline is a pretty good solution for Node. Just to, just to be um, really like really graphical and brief about this, so sales sales isn't going to help you solve any problems that Node doesn't already solve. Um, the goal of Sales JS and Waterline is to is to make your life easier when working within the Node JS paradigm. So like it's not going to be used for building a website for your cat because that's like you can you can use other stuff for that. And it's also not good for building laser guided missiles because nobody knows how to do that in Node. Um, you're going to be using some crazy technology that hasn't been invented yet. And um, we, we try to focus on like this this middle ground where we're, like building practical stuff that people will use um, and hopefully pay you to build for them. We're gonna go over API-driven development really quick. I think this is like, I've got like one more slide. Um, okay, like it works with test-driven development. Um, the reason is because API-driven development is really about prototyping your application out as you go, sort of in an iterative fashion, not trying to um, like architect or, or design all of your API endpoints um, or all of your API or all of your functions at the beginning. Um, the, one of the underlying ideas behind API-driven development is that it's, it's very similar to um, like doing mockups and wireframes as a communication piece on the front end. This is sort of the analog to the back end. And the premise is that you never know what you're gonna be building until you build it. If you think if you, think you know at the beginning of a project what your project is gonna actually look like when you deliver it, you're 
probably wrong, and that assumption leads to like a lot of ex expensive mistakes uh, most of the time. You're, it's a good way to like start coding and then having to undo stuff uh, as you go. As you build out your API endpoints and, and functions in your API, um, in sort of the along with the sales mindset of making your life easier, you can plug it into Swagger, which is a documentation generator, and you can document stuff as you go also, so you can get um, you know, some quick functionality, some quick tests written, some quick documentation uh, as you build out your, your back end, and it, it works pretty well that way. Can work, okay, so right, so it works with a bunch of different ways of developing software. This is a buzzword. Um, and same thing here, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't confine you to building the back end at the same pace uh, or, or in the same manner as the front end. You can proceed at different paces de depending on the business needs. Okay, so yeah, it can, it can give you some organizational uh, benefits in your development process. This is more buzzwords. And, and this, is, this is important though. So in, especially in Node, which is like a great, um, Node is a, like the perfect example of like the Twitterization of software because everything in Node is like really tiny. Like the whole idea is you work in these tiny, tiny modules. A module can be anywhere from like a huge API to like a single function. So you might include a Node module and it's just like one thing. The, the consequence of that is in Node particularly, most of your software that you'll ever write in Node is just gonna be called by their software. The end user who's actually using your software is generally like way down the line, like this distant idea that they're using software that's gonna be calling other software that's gonna get eventually like works its way up the chain to interface with your API. And getting your API prototyped out and developing a, like a pretty solid contract with whatever other application is gonna be using it, getting, getting that spec'd out early and quickly is generally valuable. So that's it. Uh, thank you for coming. No, I'm, I'm, I've got some, I got some code um, that I want to run through here. I hope this doesn't fall while I'm typing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through um, a quick demo of like how I would go about starting some new application in sales, how it fits in with some of these API-driven development ideas, and. Um, you guys can uh, ask me questions as we go. What's up? Can you zoom? Yeah, I'll zoom. Zooming is a good idea. Sorry. All right, I've even got, wait a second. I can do this better. Is that, well, okay, it's at the bottom. Who cannot read that? Who cannot hear me? Okay. <laughs> it's like the it's like a keyboard not detected. Press F1 to continue. All right, I'll zoom this one too because I'm going to be using both of these terminals at one point. Okay, so I've got an empty folder. Um, in sales, you can generate a new uh, application pretty quickly just by just by doing this. Um, I'll call it. Uh, I'll just call it sales demo. Okay. These are different font sizes. Okay. Okay, so it generated a folder for me. Um, this is just some, some basic uh, directory structure that comes with a sales app. If I do uh, sales lift, it will load the app and it will give me some Spins up a server, it's an express server in Node. And it just gives you a, a, a nice little um, landing page here. Not this one, although that would be cool. All right, so great. Gives you a nice home page. This, this is just like your, your boilerplate basic. You've done nothing yet, but it looks nice, right? So it gives me some hints. So step one, I can generate a REST API. I'll zoom in on this too so you guys can read it. Um, generating a REST API means 
I'm going to expose an endpoint on my REST server that some other application can access and then interact with the server. So if I actually do this, if I run sales generate API user, what that actually means is I'm gonna generate an endpoint for a user, user model, right? So if I have a domain object called user, which I think in most applications we're probably going to, um, we can go ahead and create that. So I can just say sales generate API user. Okay, that's fun. So let's also say that, let's, let's get interesting. Let's actually say that um, this is a, some sort of business application and the user is gonna have some uh, roles that actually like, confer permissions on what they're allowed to do, for example. Role. We're now gonna have two endpoints. This is asking me what sort of migrate setting I want. Um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. I'm selecting two. And now I can go to Postman. Raise your hand if you, if you use Postman for developing stuff. Awesome, all of you are using sales already because Postman is written in sales. Bam ching. All right. I, pl I planned that so well. Okay, so what I did here is I just made a, uh, I can't, all right, I'm gonna jump, ready? Uh, get request, all right. I made a get to slash user, localhost 1337 slash user. Uh, it just gave me an empty list back, just gave me a JSON response, because that's the sort of thing that I'm probably interested in. But I, there's no user, so it just gave me an empty list. Well, let's, let's create a user real quick. We can create a user just by posting to that. That's kind of small still, isn't it? All right. Mac key, key combinations. Oh. It's like I've done this before. All right, now we're just gonna post to a user. We're gonna send it a JSON object. Make sense? So we're just gonna do that. And we're going to find where the response is. All right, so I got a response. Um, it's a 201 created, which sounds like the type of response that we want because I'm creating stuff. Uh, it gave me an object back. I sent in the username TJ Webb because that's me. Uh, it generated, the database generated an ID um, and it automatically uh, timestamps the um, the actions for you. You can turn those off if you want. But I find this pretty useful uh, in most cases. What's the default database? Is it Mongo? Great question. Let's, uh, let's look at the default database. Notice that I'm adding stuff in there. I didn't even, I didn't set up a database, right? So let's get concrete. By default, sales includes a local data store uh, that just stores actually your database in a JSON file. This is a feature on purpose. We don't want you to have to choose what database you want as the first decision of your application. Um, that can come later when you actually know what it is that you're actually building, right? The, the, again, the, the fundamental pre premise here is that you don't have all the answers up front. And the second you start choosing a particular data store uh, as, as one of the early decisions in your, in your application uh, development process. That's again, just a good way to make some expensive mistake that you have to undo later, or even probably worse, you, that you can't undo and that you're just stuck with some database forever that you actually didn't intend to use in the first place. So like say you start uh, using Mongo, which like everybody does for some reason, and then you realize that like, oh, I actually needed to like joins and, and like I had any support transactions. Right, so then you have to you have to back out of that somehow. Um, here, I just have this JSON file. So this is this is where my stuff is. Um, so this is a list of all the users and my users right there. Let's um, let's hook it up to a real database. Um, I use Docker for most of my local dev stuff. I've got Postgres running, so that's not okay. So this is my Docker thing. I've got a Postgres server running on 192.168.99.100. So what we can do is, 
Um, I'm going to I'm going to link this because I don't want to destroy the right Wi-Fi. Um, you can. Waterline is an adapter-based ORM. So there's a bunch of these adapters. One of them happens to be called PostgreSQL adapter. I'm going to install this into my new sales project. Okay. And let's, let's go ahead and set that up. I can go into connections. This is the default connection, local disk. The adapter is called sales disk. It's just an adapter that allows Waterline to connect to that local file and store everything in there. There's also an adapter for Mongo, MySQL, Couch, Cassandra, Postgres, a ton of other databases I haven't heard of, Redis, Orient, anyway, there are lots of them. Um, Postgres is, at Balderdash we typically use Postgres as a default. It's, it's, it's our default approach. It, it, it handles most uh, use cases pretty well. So I'm just gonna, I'll call this connection Docker Postgres. Let's give it some semantic meaning. And my host was 99100. Who thinks that's right? It is right. I think it's right. You are correct. <laughs> Three, the port is 32775 because Doctor, Docker gives everything weird ports. Um, the user was, I think it's just Postgres. Password is, I think it's PG Docker. There's an environment variable somewhere. PG Docker is the password. Don't hack my machine. All right. Bonus points for anybody who can log into this database uh, over Wi Fi. Actually, better than bonus points. I've, I, yeah, go for it. I have a better idea. I'm sort of running out of these, so I'm, I apologize if I don't have your size. Are we gonna have to wear some matching wrap ups? But I have some sales shirts. Mm -hmm. If anyone would like one, um, first person to hack into my laptop gets a shirt. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm calling the FBI. <laughs> you don't have a guy in the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not me. I'm putting this up. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think that looks good, right? Docker, Postgres, that's all the stuff. Yeah, makes sense. Host, port, user, password. I think that's all I need. Um, and so now I'm going to go um, open up this other file called models, which says this is the connection I want to use. By default, it uses local disk DB. And um, I'm going to use migrate alter. When I set migrate alter, that means that when I fire up sales and it connects to my Postgres database, it's going to alter the schema in such a way that all the tables that I need and all the columns and constraints and whatnot are created for me. You guys didn't tell me that I forgot to actually put the database name in here. It's very bad. Which is, what actually is the database name? Okay, I, create, I created a database called Sales MN, and it's just empty right now. Okay, I'm gonna close this. All right, that was from a previous, okay. Cool, so I'm gonna do Sales Lift. Hopefully it connects. So load it up. Now let's, I'm going to create my user again. Uh, post. Okay, I've got a response. Doesn't have username in it. I wonder why that is. So sales has a distinction between schemaful and schema-less. 
databases. Postgres obviously requires a schema. In schema-less databases like Mongo, Couch, and this local J JSON store, you don't have to define all the attributes on your models before you just start, you can just start inserting stuff and it'll accommodate that. Postgres, it needs to know that you're gonna have a username column uh, before you actually start shoving data into it. So that's why here, um, in our response, there's no username here. So let's, let's see what this looks like. Open up the user model. This is what you get by default when you do sales generate API user. It generates this model file for you. And we're gonna create a username attribute. And if I can type, let's say type equals string, because it is. And um, let's make it unique, because usernames probably should be unique. And we want our user to have, we, we, we created role, right? Because we want it to have, we want it to have roles. So we can hook that up like this. All right, I bet we have a user in here with a null user, username. That's the one I created earlier. Now I'm gonna create one with my actual name. Great. Now it, let me zoom in again. All right, so now I created this. This is the same thing we got before, right? Except I didn't assign a role, so now it has no role. Username's TJ Webb. But now if we open up Postgres, and zoom out. Then we get sales MN, public. All right, so we have two tables. Role and user, sales created those for me. Um, user has some stuff in there. That's the stuff that I inserted over the REST API, right? So th this is, this right here is sort of is sort of the essence of the API driven development concept that I was I'm, I'm trying to get at and just kind of you know walk through is that I didn't have to design any of this I just started throwing data at the server and it grabbed it and started shoving it in tables right I that's that's what I want I, I just want a server that I can do stuff with and to and it just sort of allows me to do that while I figure out what it is that I'm actually supposed to be doing. So let's say we want our user to have, we'll just do one more iteration here. So we don't want our user to have one role, right? Maybe a user is um, you know, in the accounting department, but they're also like in the sales department or something, right? Some, some crazy businessy thing um, we have to accommodate here. But we didn't, we didn't know that up front, right? The, the customer or my boss just said like, ah, the user should have a role or something, right? But they're like, well, actually it makes more sense if they have multiple roles. So now we have to you know, set that up. So, okay, we're gonna create a role. A role should probably have a name, right? And then um, the role will have, we're gonna set up a many-to-many -many relationship now, actually. So we're gonna say a user has many roles. This is the collection of role. And we're gonna set up the reverse relationship also. So users. Uh, is a collection of user. And the way we link these up in Waterline is we use a via keyword in Waterline to let Waterline know how to link these two models up. So in user, over here on the left, I can say via users. And that just basically says join user on role where this user is in the list of users that that role has, right? This isn't straight, you can't write this in straight SQL, right, because it's a many to many. So um, if you're writing SQL, this is actually be like, like two, like a left, an inner join and then like a left join, because you have to have a join table in the middle, right? So. Many to many to many. It's, it's what? Many to many to many. 
Yeah, many to, yeah, exactly. Uh, either way, not fun to create manually. So, and this is gonna be via roles. Just creating a two-way uh, relationship here. And you lift our server again. All right, now we're gonna look at the database real quick and refresh it. Now we have this other table here. So, setting up relationships, again, I, I don't, say I, I don't even know SQL, right? Or I know SQL, but I don't, I don't really wanna write it. I'd rather just do this. It creates a join table for me, and now I can start connecting stuff up through my REST interface, and it'll just, it'll do what it needs to do in the database. Like Rails? Grails? Grails? Like Cruels? Like, next, like, doesn't look too crazy. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, like, sales, right, so sales tries to strike a balance between, um, you know, it, it's, like, on one hand, it's like hipster magic, right? It's like, hey, just do this and everything will work out. But it, at the end of the day, you can, it, at any point, you can dig into stuff and mess with it if you need to. Um, as a practical matter, these days, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the machinery, because I, you know, my job is to get stuff done. Um, you know, I can go home and, and tinker with stuff if I want to. So if you need a, you get to a point where you have a million users, you need to start optimizing things, and so forth, there, you, you can dig as, as deep as you need to. But again, at you know, phase one, we're just prototyping some stuff out, we wanna show that we, you know, say like the UI is being built and they need a back end because now they're kind of starting to figure out what they want. You can spin up a back end pretty quickly that does approximately what you need to and then you can refine along the way. So okay, so we started our server back up. And we're gonna create a role. Let's create a, a role called with name admin because that's my favorite role. I like being admin. I'm gonna post that just like I posted the user. I get the response that we're becoming familiar with. It's just a JSON object that says this is the thing you created. And um, let's, um, let's add that role to our user. So now we have a little bit longer string here. I'm also gonna change this ID. So now our, our, our URL path looks like this. Add is a verb. The rest of this stuff is your join path. So slash user means I'm gonna be operating on a user. Slash two, that's the primary key. So this is just sort of idiomatic, like RESTful interface. Um, sales takes this approach where you can concatenate the primary key onto your path and you just directly get that, the, the resource that corresponds to that primary key. So user slash two, it says, I'm gonna be doing some stuff to user slash two. With, with ID two, and then and then it says I'm going to add something onto the roles relation onto that user. This is my object. I'm sending an ID one because ID because one is the ID of the role I just created a second ago. I'm going to send that in. Post that. All right, now I get a much. Well, it's kind of cut off, but because my screen is weird. But um, actually, I'll just yeah, okay. Oh, oh, it's just cutting off the updated um, at date stamp. But now I get a bigger object back. Now I get back the user, except now it has roles attached to it. It has a list of roles. Right now, it's just one role. But now the admin user is attached to uh, the admin role is attached to the. Um, user with ID two. So let me zoom out for a second. Now if I go back to get user, it's like I just want a list of all users. So now I have two users. One is, this is the, you know, the crap user that I created at the very beginning that has no username and no roles. But now there's this one, you know, with TJ Webb with that role attached to it, right? And it's a list of roles. So I, could, I can continue adding more roles onto that user in the same way. So all the joins are done for me in the database. Um, if we open up the database, it looks um, about what, like what you'd expect. Yep. 
you can, you can do it either way. So if I do slash roles, slash role, now each role has the users attached to it. This is all default settings. Um, in some applications, you can imagine that, say I want a list of stuff, but I don't want to do an inner join on all of its fields every time, right? I don't want to pull every, this giant object graph out of the database. Um, I want to you know, request that stuff like on demand as I need it, right? So by default, it grabs everything. Um, this, this mechanism in sales is, are called blueprints. There are a ton of blueprints configs. You can pretty granularly configure this stuff to behave how you want. So if you don't want to grab this stuff by default, you can turn that off. Um, in the request string itself, you can specify exactly which relations you want to populate. Um, with There's a field called populate, and you just say which you know, associations you want to populate. So say a role also has like permissions. You can just specify exactly which relations you want to populate in your request. Because different requests might have different requirements depending on who's calling that endpoint. I'm going to shut down the sales server. And at this point, I'm really going to hand it over to you guys. I want to see what questions you guys have. Was anybody able to hack into my laptop, or was anybody trying? You said we couldn't. Huh? You said we couldn't. I, I said you couldn't as a challenge. And you're supposed to say, challenge accepted. <laughs> That's OK if nobody hacked it. The, my, my talk kept working, so I'm fine with that. Uh, yeah, so the, the join table, just it sets up a join, a join situation for you. This is the role table. You know, all, all this stuff is inserted. I don't have to deal with anything. Um, if you want to turn debugging on in sales, it'll just it'll spit out all the actual SQL it's generating. So if something is not working right, or if you're trying to optimize something, you can look at what SQL it's give. It's actually you know sending to the database. So all that stuff is visible if you want it to be. So in this case, the array of, of data that comes back, the role table schema actually didn't change. Um, all it has is um, those fields. And user is the same, just has a username. So when I get back that array of roles or an array of users, depending on how I request, that's really a, a function of it going through this join table to figure out how, how role and user are connected up. Um, you know, th these, it generates some, just some columns here. So ID really isn't important, but role users, user roles, that just says which um, user is connected to which role and vice versa. So for, for uh, you know, if, if I had a, a user with five roles, there'd be like, there'd be five rows in this table. So this is, this is the typical sort of many join table you have to have in a many-to-many -many, um, association situation in a, in a traditional relational database. You join through this other table to be able to go have arrays on both sides. Qu questions? Yes. So if we looked at, I don't want to keep coming back to the database too often, but really what happened is when role was, when there was a one to many, when user had only one role, there would be a role, there was a role column here that was just a foreign key into the role table directly. So, so the so by default with the alter migration. If you have a, a one-to-many that turns into a many-to-many, -many, it backs up your table into RAM, which is a, sort of a limitation. So you have a giant table, it will take a while. But it backs up your table, drops the table, recreates the table into the schema that it needs, and then reinserts everything. So in this case, if, if you go from a one-to-many to many-to-many, to many, then you can do that. If you go in the reverse, it'll, it'll dump your data out and be like, I don't know how you want me to connect this up, right? 
some things only go one direction. But in the, in the migrations that can go in that direction, sales will back up the data and reinsert it for you. Question. Question. Yes, I, I configured them to be automatic by setting the, the migrate setting in the, the models config earlier. So, right, so when I, when, I, when I did this, if I go back to here, where it says migrate alter down here, this is one of the migration settings. There are other migration settings, including safe, which is typically what you, what you want to do in production. In production, I don't like having software messing with my data, because it's production data, especially if the system is running while I'm upgrading stuff. Um, there's also create, which will only do additive changes. It won't actually, if, if, if there are any possibilities for data destruction, it will not do those migrations, and it will give you a warning in the console when you, when you load sales. Because it'll be like, hey, I'm not gonna drop this table, because you migrate settings create. Um, alter is, the most, is, is probably the most destructive one. It's the one that says, you know, it's for development mode. It's like, I'm, I'm gonna totally reconfigure the database, just do it all for me. So there are a few different migration settings. But in this case, it does, it does all that automatically. Yeah, so alter add, this alter is essentially, if you think of other frameworks, it's essentially an alter add. It will alter a table and it will, it will also add new columns or constraints onto it. Um, Uh, it will, it will. If it if it needs to delete something, it will fail. It'll it'll just it'll just bail out. And it'll be like, hey, I can't I can't migrate this automatically. Yeah. Question. For testing. testing. So w at Balderdash we use Mocha. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Once you get start getting these REST endpoints set up, and again, I, I there are a bunch of different directions I could go here, but um, testing just wasn't one that I had time for. But there are two ways to test. One, we like using Postman to just prototype stuff and get a sense of you know, what the responses look like. Once we have these REST endpoints set up, we like using super test inside of Mocha um, to just, you can really easily start sending data to these REST endpoints and get a sense of whether they work. So it's a, it's a good kind of balance between a, a full integration test and a unit test. You just, you spin up the server and you can just start, you start hitting stuff. Um, and in that way, you can also, it, it's, it's also a good way to unit test with different databases, because when you spin up sales in your testing environment, you can pick what configuration it uses. So if you want to test on Postgres versus other databases, for example, you can, you can do that and see how things go. Um, and you can also do, do that for benchmarking, too. If you want to see, hey, I'm, I know I'm going to be using these particular methods in my application, I want to see which database is faster, right? Just as a as a quick benchmark. So, can you talk a little bit about controllers? Controller, sure. We can go into that. Um, so, so, sure. Okay. Yes. That's, you can definitely do that. So I'll, I'll answer that and then I'll go to the, I'll touch on controllers for a second. So in Waterline, when I, when I, if I go back to here, this one connection here, I'm saying I want to use this connection for all models. But if you want, I can go over here and I can override per model and I would say, oh, this connection, this one is in, you know, uh, Docker Postgres. But possibly this other one, you know, is in some other database. So you can, you can set the connection property on a per model basis if you have different models that you want to store in different places. And one thing Waterline can actually do is it can do cross adapter joins through Node. So if you have some stuff in Mongo and some other stuff in wherever, you can, you can set, you basically you set up a join by, by, de by designating one of the databases to hold the join table, and then it, it uses that to join everything across, uh, across adapters. Uh, controllers. So, so in sales, right now I'm using, everything I'm doing is, is default, out of the box sales blueprints, where
where it's generating REST endpoints based on the models I'm creating. So I'm starting in my, my model layer, I'm creating domain objects, and it's reflecting my ORM up onto the web service that's then publishing these REST endpoints. If I want to override or change or add any of those, um, when I did sales generate API uh, user and role, it created controllers also that are also empty. By default, each of these controllers has create, read, update, and delete endpoints. It also has add and remove for manipulating associations. Um, but in here, I can create uh, controller actions that are actually just uh, bound into the application as express middleware. So if I want to do some, some custom action, if you know express, this is going to look really familiar. You, you just deal with the request and the response however you want. So this is just another, it's an express route handler. It's, it's as if you had express and you define your route and you, so in this case, this is inside user controller. So when I, when I create this function, by default in Blueprints, when I load up my app, I'm now gonna have an endpoint called slash user slash custom action. It's gonna generate endpoints for all of your controller actions by default. So again, it's, it, it just allows you to avoid doing a lot of that plumbing and wiring manually. You just get to write code. The talk I'm giving here is on, on API-driven development. Um, sales can do a lot of stuff, which I, I couldn't possibly cover here. Sales does do, um, can serve as a, as a full integrated MVC framework. So you can go all the way from databases, all, all, databases all the way to the view layer. Um, it supports all the typical templating engine, engines. Um, pick your favorite one, handlebars, EJS, React, if you wanna do isomorphic rendering, mustache, Jekyll, there's, yeah, there's a ton, ton of them that it supports. Um, a comprehensive list is, is on the, in the documentation. Um, but you can, I didn't create the views folder. Oh, I did, actually. Views folder is here. So if you go in here, but the default um, rendering engine is EJS, and so it just comes with some boilerplate stuff, but you can swap that out with whatever you want to do. Um, typically at, at Balderdash, when we're building things, a lot of the time, we will start with the API first and have the, the UI is kind of being built in parallel while where the UI is more of the, like the cu customer conversation piece. It's the, it's the language that we use to interact with the customer and, to, and figure out if we're building what they want. And then we're, we kind of hook that up to the back end later. So we, uh, when we develop, Full applications, we typically have the server and the client as separate projects, but that's that's just our approach. It's not um, it's not right or wrong. It's just how it's it fits into it with with our typical process. Question. Yeah. So uh, I was. Um, we're having this discussion. I was in Atlanta on Monday. And I gave a similar talk, and and we were we were having this discussion there because it's re with npm and GitHub, uh, it's really hard to really put your finger on a, like a precise number of users. Um, we've had over a million downloads since it was released. We have about sixty thousand a month on npm. Um, we understand that like a lot of that is continuous integration, um, but. Sales is a is a is pretty far upstream in terms of um, the the dependency tree. So you typically don't have like sales as like a dependency of a, de a de de dependency. It's usually installed globally on the machine. So um, we have a lot of users. Our our issue tracker is really active. We have about twelve thousand something stars on GitHub. Um, we're the like the fifth or sixth most popular framework on all of GitHub, behind in the second most popular behind Meteor. Um, if you count Express, then we're also behind that, but um, we, we aim for a different uh, kind of development process as, as Express, and Express is under, as a dependency of us. So, um, yeah, there's, there, so sales is extended through a concept called hooks. Um, it's, it's your ability to write, essentially, sales plugins that modify the behavior of the framework or augment behavior of the framework, 
and um, those are those are swimming around. There's 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 stuff for authentication with Passport JS permissioning, um, it, it, you know, kind of template boilerplate like CRM and CMS type applications with a bunch of like models already uh, prefabbed for you. bunch of bunch of generators. So if you have a bunch of apps that look the same and you want to have the same directory structure, you can pre-generate different flavors of sales app. So there's a, a lot of a lot of different options there. Um, sales is used by a bunch of large uh, corporations. So even though Walmart published Happy, they do have a lot of usage in sales of sales internally um, in Walmart Labs. We know that Microsoft uses them, IBM, um, a lot of a lot of big companies have have teams running on sales. Fidelity, you know, just Jet, JetBlue, it's to, to name a couple more. There are a bunch bunch floating around there. So sales, the usage is, is pretty strong, um, and it, it's regularly one of the top node frameworks. So you'll, if you want to dive in, you'll definitely have support available from the community. So this is a name that's pretty easy to compare sales with Rails. Do you think that that's a fair comparison? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is eponymous of Rails for that reason. It's, it doesn't... It, it doesn't, um, the, the, ph the philosophy is slightly different. The goals are similar. The goal is to make your life easier and, and do stuff faster. Sales is quite a bit less opinionated than Rails, and it, we, don't, we don't try to be as prescriptive. Um, we try to give you freedom when you need it, but provide scaffolding where it's necessary and where it's helpful. But if you want to go off the rails and, and do whatever you want, um, that's, you know, that's just a sort of use at your own risk type thing. We don't make that impossible. Um, it's, it's just a, it's, it's your preference. Okay. Yeah. Question? Back to what you just said, does that make it something that will last longer or just makes it easily replaced or simply go? Replaced by what, like a competitor or? Yeah, or a new system. A new system. We, we don't. That's, I mean, that's hard to say. Node, the Node.js ecosystem is, is gangbusters right now. So a lot of this is, we have, it's a pretty solid framework. We have a lot of large users. We have a large number of users. And we get to ride the coattails of, of the popularity of Node itself. So in that sense, um, I would say that betting on sales, as with, as with any other Node framework, you're betting on the ecosystem of Node itself. So um, the, the, the Longevity and, and robustness of sales are inextricably linked to that of Node. Um, I'm happy to bet on Node personally. At, in, our, in our business, um, we we have a lot of production applications on Node. We have a lot of lot of users on the applications that we built in Node. And now seeing a lot of these larger corporate uh, enterprises adopting Node and trying to adopt Node, the the re, like in our view, and with, with the optics we have in, in, with some of our clients, the adoption rate of Node is limited nearly exclusively by the amount of talent that these companies can hire. So like if you go, to, if you go into um, like some large company that's trying to convert stuff to Node, they're going to be like, OK, well, we, need, we have 1,000 job developers right now. If we want to switch to Node, we have to hire a thousand node developers. Well, you can't because there are not a thousand node developers on the market, probably. So the liquidity of the labor market is really the limiting factor at this point. And a lot of these large companies also are investing a lot of money in training, so retraining their existing people to be to kind of think in the node mindset. And um, and that's that's really a lot of the limit right now. It's it's node is kind of graduated beyond the convince your boss problem in a lot of cases. It's, it's a pretty mature platform, and it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's technically superior than a lot of the other traditional platforms in all the ways that we're familiar with and, and keep hearing. So um, yeah, we're betting on Node, and that's, that's, yeah, that's about uh, my, my case for it. <laughs> other questions? Yes. How, uh, how the senior validation of the model, is that somehow tied to Swagger validation system? So we use Swagger mostly for generating documentation at the moment. 
Um, we don't really use it in reverse where you can build a swagger document or a swagger specification and, and then like hydrate that into an application. Um, I can show you a quick example. Um, so say, say we wanted to like, let's just convert this. So where's my, okay, so again, I'm gonna link this module so I don't have to destroy the Wi-Fi. So if I install this, and if I redo uh, sales lift, this is the module, that, the add-on module that we use. And um, if I just crack open, it generates a swagger specification for the app I just made. So, okay, it's kind of huge because swagger has a lot of stuff, but um, okay, yeah, so like these are all the, uh, tons of endpoints. So like if I do roll slash find, I can get it. And then here's another, um, there's another challenge coming up um, for the, uh, the astute observer. This is our swagger uh, generation page. This is just a default project that we, we hook up to it. Um, this is actually the, the sales permissions module, this, these docs. So, if I put in um, this URL, all right, it says can't read from server. It may not have the appropriate access control origin settings. Anybody know what that is? Hint, so when I put in this URL, the browser is making the request to this URL that I type in. I need to um, configure cores in my server here. Sales has a cores module that's built in. So I need to enable cores so that I can make cross origin requests. I need to uh, open up my routes, config, just doing, this is just an example of some of the stuff you can configure in, in sales. So my uh, swagger doc endpoint needs to enable my core settings. Let's hope it works now. So, okay, I'll expand a couple of these just to, uh, okay, so user. This is all the stuff you can do on user by default. It's a lot of routes. You can, again, you can disable these uh, as, as you want. Um, typically when we are developing stuff at Balderdash, we'll start out with like just enabling the, all these blueprints and then we'll, we'll circumscribe the API more and more so that by the time we get to, the, get to production, the surface area of the API is as narrow as it can be um, while supporting all the necessary functionality. So for example, get user slash ID, that's one of the things that I talked about earlier. And um, we can try it out. I should have just done my, done my demo on this instead of Postman. So ID2 had some stuff, right? Try it out. Yeah, so there's my user. This is a response from localhost in the Swagger docs. So your TJ Web admin, right? We already saw all that. Um, I'll zoom in in case not everybody can see it. So Swagger is pretty cool. Swagger not only generates documentation, but it generates this like this test usage interface as well that you can use to start you know trying out stuff. It's again an, an, another way to assist in the prototyping process. Did that? like touch on your question or is that, you have any other? Okay, do, we, do you have a question back there also? Yeah, what? I was curious, you know, I think you might have asked me about talking about that, what was the key from talking about, I want to add a user, why is that not just a post, why is it more of an ad? So I think it was maybe the results of the ad, can you explain why you, why you would do ads? Yeah. Sure, so the ad is there because in that case where I'm, indicating that I'm adding a relation onto another object. So that request looked like, right, 
Right. Yes. So another, for example, another way to do this is I, got, I could actually just post it there. So if I do this, um, user one is, oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So slash add is just a again, it's it's semantic. It's like syntax sugar for making the route a little bit more descriptive. I can just post it here. I could also, um, instead of posting the user one roles, I could actually just put on user slash one with a role in my object. So I could say, um, now the this now I'm post creating a user. I'm putting, I'm I'm seeing an update command to user slash one. So I don't need this. Now I could just do this um, and send it some, uh, yeah, there we go, it's a list. The ID of the role was one, I think. Yeah, you can do a put command too. All those, all those work in the way you'd expect. Other questions? Right here. Back to uh, Swagger, um, does Bill provide any way to delegate the actual database from the database that Bill creates to the app? The actual database. So yeah, for, in other words, I don't want to put it in and use it for my actual database, but I'd like him to be able to exercise To play with it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's nodes. You could just spin up multiple instances of your app, right? You could you could run it on a different port or something. Um, Oh, oh yeah. So one thing we actually really like doing is we like building sales apps that we include from other sales apps. And so another thing we like doing is building a sales application that has all your, all your database connections and all your ORM, and then having other sales applications just require that so that we can have a bunch of applications that share the same ORM but have different uh, web-facing functionality. That's a really, we like using that pattern for microservices. So if we want to have a happy style microservice architecture where we want to have one ORM definition but a bunch of different web services hosted on um, either different machines or different possible different hosts for whatever sort of thing you're trying to achieve, either load balancing, distribution of, of load, um, or something like what you're talking about where we want to have the same configuration but have different uh, sub configurations with different applications. That's a way to do that. Um, me explaining it doesn't probably doesn't sound very simple, but it's it's pretty straightforward to create a sales application and just include that in another one, um, and it'll it'll mix in all of its configs and, and other things. Other questions? There's those one more over here. Maybe not. Sure. Optimistic locking. Yeah, so wh whatever the data store you choose, whatever, whatever type of locking mechanism it uses um, will be the default. So that's going to be implemented, for the most part, at the database level, that's going to be implemented by the waterline adapters. Um, if you want to implement an application uh, layer op uh, locking mechanism, then you could, you could do that in sales. Just using you know the middle using putting that logic in the middleware and it, was there another part to that question yeah um, yeah not out of the box that's that's something you could build yourself but it, I don't it wouldn't be too difficult you could either use the the, the timestamps you know, for the, the updated and created at dates as a, as a proxy for versioning. You could use a version to data store like CouchDB that maintains versions of all the documents you insert it uh, into it naturally. There's yeah, a, few way, a few different ways to do that, but it, um, that's, yeah, it's not supported out of the box at the moment. It'd be a good add-on to add in. I don't, 
There might be one out there, but I don't, I don't, we, we haven't used one. Other questions? What's up? Uh, yeah, there's no Docker file. Um, I mean, it's, it runs on a pretty vanilla Node environment, so all you really just need is Node. Um, everything else is up to you. So there's not a lot of like infrastructure you really need to set up. It'll, it'll just run on any Node box. It'll run on Linux, Windows, Mac. And um, I think Docker is probably good for if you want to set up databases. Um, a typical, a pretty typical deployment infrastructure for us is Redis for session uh, sharing and, and socket sharing. So for socket IO, if we have a distributed cluster, we use Redis for sharing the socket IO sockets as well as the sessions. Uh, Postgres for the persistence layer. And we have some horizontally scaling um, node web service. So like Heroku is a good, um, a good example of that. But they don't use Docker. Um, and um, yeah, actually, I think I searched on this Docker thing. I think I found a couple sales options. Like if I do sales, so like there's a ton of Docker images already that involve sales to some degree. That you know these people have all set up their own sales environments in Docker, and um, I don't have a strong opinion on. Yeah, that we there's we don't have an official one, and there's. There's not really one that I have a strong preference for. So. I have a question. Um, have you ever run a project using sales and then you, know, you had a strategy to make sales work for the rest of the year for the project? And what's the, what's the I, I mean, I've had the opposite occur, but um, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Have, have I ever regretted using sales at the end of something? Maybe not or like, was there some better? Well, I mean, in some cases where we're building some enterprise thing, and again, this goes back to my slide with the, the cat and the, the predator drone. Like, I've, I've thought at the end of the project, well, pff, we should have just used Java or something, right? Because like, well, we're using JDBC or something, right? So in cases like that, I think, I think the, you might look back or you might be better served maybe to use a different language um, for some use cases. It, it, in cases where Node, for example, in the enterprise, Node doesn't have great enterprise extension support yet. Um, or if you need to like work with an Oracle database, the Oracle driver is like nine months old. So um, in those cases, you, you might be kicking yourself like, I just sh like should have used .NET or Java for some of that stuff. But who knows what you'd be doing in five years when like nobody's using some Java jar anymore, right? Because they've, they've, it's been rebuilt in Node. So um, I've had those sorts of thoughts, but I haven't, for, for stuff that Node is good at, sales is at least as good. So and that's, that's basically the, the, the pattern that we've found for all of our projects. Question? Do you have any performance metrics for how much overhead sales took? We do. How much, uh, yeah, um, they're on GitHub. I don't. Uh, I don't know if I could find them right now, but they, I can give you a quick rundown. Um, sales is about three to 4% slower than Express, just bare metal Express. So it's very, over Express, it's very small amount of overhead. Um, that's, that's really the benchmark that we use. So as long as we're like within a few percent, 10% really of, of the performance of Express, then that's great for us. I mean, our, my goal when I'm deploying something is I, wanna, I just want to know that can I make it faster by throwing more hardware at it? And that's, that's really where I'm coming from when I'm making some of these performance decisions in sales or if we're de deciding what optimizations to pull in. Um, we're hesitant to introduce complexity at, at, in, in order to benefit performance by some, some small margin. As long as we're within 10% or so of the performance of raw express, that's pretty good. And sales offers a lot for that small amount of overhead. Did so, it, it, no, go for it. What, if what's sales are slower, then why would you use sales over express? Uh, if, you, if you value your machine's time more than your own, uh, then you should not use sales. 
Uh, I personally, it like, I, you know, I run a consulting firm and we all have jobs where we're like expected to do stuff and like impress our bosses or whoever. And um, like my job is to make people more productive. So in other words, Dell should eventually be able to settle down into its core. Uh, it's, right now it really is expressed just with a bunch of middleware included. Um, you can pare down sales to be basically what Raw Express is by you can manually, there's about a 16 or so hooks, sales hooks, the plugin system that I mentioned, core hooks that are included with sales. One of those is the view templating engine, there's socket IO, there's the blueprint generator, there's a bunch of that stuff that you can remove if you want. Um, for example, we've, we've set up very bare metal sales installations to serve as RabbitMQ nodes. So we have some sales application fronting you know, as, a, as a web server front, and there's a RabbitMQ adapter for Waterline. So we actually will, we like to use, we can, we can send a, like through our REST endpoints, instead of being persisted, persisted into some table, it's sent out as a RabbitMQ message. And that can be picked up by other um, node nodes, other node listener apps, and we just build those in sales and just disable a, a bunch of, we, you can disable the HTTP hook which won't even load Express at all, but you can do a bunch of other stuff. So it's, it's pretty, you can configure a lot of stuff, yeah. Other questions? What's up? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of WebSocket support out of the box. You can, the, the big sort of headline feature is that you can subscribe to model events. So for in your browser, you can say whenever some model of this, of whatever type is created, added, deleted, um, updated, if, it, if it's a, re a relation is added to it, all that stuff, I want to be notified. So you, the browser can essentially be a listener on database events via sales in Socket.io. That's what, we like using it for that. Um, sort of back to the RabbitMQ thing, we've built a, a large, one of our clients, we built a large distributed user messaging system um, basically a, like a chat room slash private messaging thing, sort of like Slack, I guess, um, using RabbitMQ on the back end and Socket.io um, on the front end. So you immediately get, basically it's, it's a, like, it's Socket.io like through sales, like directly to RabbitMQ. Um, and we just, we get all, all Rabbit messages end up turning into messages on the browser through the sales WebSocket support. So it's pretty cool. Um, it, it's, yeah, it does all the, the things that you would expect uh, Socket.io to do. Subscribing to stuff and, and getting, getting updates on server-side uh, events quickly. So, by the way, all this stuff that I'm talking about, um, you can find on the website. It's sales.js, can I type? Yeah, sales.js.org. That's our, our squid. Question? Uh, in version 11, is it still released right now? And 11 and 12, is there any major deal in 12 where it's So yeah, the current stable release is 0 0.11.2. Okay. Um, 0 0.11 uh, has been out for a while. We patched it up to point 0 0.11.2 to support node 4. So um, all the latest node 4s are, suppo are supported by sales. Uh, sales.12 is currently in release candidate stage. Um, it should be, should be getting released soon. I'm, I'm on like, I'm on master right now, right? So yeah, when you saw my version, it's like 0.12.3 dash something. Um, the, a couple, a couple updates in .12 are, uh, it, it makes it easier to extend certain types of functionality. So it makes it easier to mix in controllers and services from other sales applications. Um, ES6 support is better, and um, we're gonna, basically, it, it's been in RC for a while. We're, tr we're debating whether to try to um, upgrade to Express 4 also. We have, we have a, there's a giant pull request right now to, with Express 4 support, which increases performance a little bit, and, um, and, and allows us to upgrade some of our dependencies. That's, it's to be determined. Depends, depending on how many, depends on how much breakage 
we have to um, we have to deal with with Express Four. We might we might wait till till 1.0 to upgrade to Express Four, depending on compatibility concerns. Yeah, we we've always been hesitant to commit to a schedule, um, not because we're flaky, but because other things that we depend on are always changing. So we try not to we try not to release versions on a time schedule that's not actually based on like any sort of other like mean, more meaningful reality than calendar time. Um, when you know if if Node four comes out, for example, right, really release patch patch releases. Um, you know, some, some security uh, patches are in Express 4, but not 3. So that's why we're, we're trying to uh, move to Express 4. So things like that. <sighs> yeah, and well, so once we get the 4, the biggest jump in, in API uh, delta is between 3 and 4. 4 and 5 are much more similar than 4 and 3. So the upgrade will be easier once we just get to 4. Um, at this point, it's like sales, I mean, it's Node, so it, it seems kind of like new and fancy, but sales has been around since 2012. We have a pretty established user base, and so we're, we're the project is at that, is at a sort of mature-ish stage where breakage is not, um, is not on the menu. Like, we don't, we don't want to break people's stuff. We want to make, we want to have, always have a smooth upgrade path so that if you start using sales now, or started using it a year and a half ago, there's, there's not some crazy leap you have to make to get to the new version. Um, building in those polyfills and making sure the documentation is good for those upgrades are, are higher priority than like just making sure we can plus plus the, the version number somewhere. So Express 5 you know, will be hopefully added shortly after Express 4, because I, I think it'll be a, um, an easier Upgrade. There's um, there's a project called Strappy that actually is sales based on Koa, which is pretty cool. Um, there's also another project called Dogwater that is say, uh, that is Waterline plus Happy. So there's a bunch of different like mix and match you can do uh, with if if you have some some other preference for underlying routing system. Other questions? Is that it? I have shirts up here. I do not have enough for everyone because there are a lot more of you than uh, our number of shirts that I could fit in my carry-on luggage. Um, we, Randall is gonna determine some totally fair way <laughs> to give them out. <laughs> yeah, do I have, does yeah, someone build a random number generator for sales? No, for, for <laughs> uh, meetup. For meetup, actually yeah, at Norfolk JS, we, um, we have a random number generator that we use to, we randomly select someone from the RSVP list, because we hand out books and stuff. Um, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't have it on me, unfortunately. But I think, I think I'm, I'm done, unless there are more questions. Um, anybody? All right, thanks.